is, is I wanted to make sure that you uh, had a chance to weigh in on this. Um, you know, one is your current work uh, with Capstone, which I think is important in terms of um, you know, Capstone clients and how they're affected by climate change and some of the things that we have in front of us, both in, in terms of the transition, in terms of the opportunity, in terms of some of the vulnerability of uh, some of the folks who, um, uh, who you serve. Also, you have uh, kind of past professional experience that I think is really relevant to what we're doing here in terms of your um, work as the you know, Chief Recovery Officer uh, with regard to Tropical Storm Irene in terms of your work as uh, the head of uh, VTrans and the work that you did there, which is, you know, ultimately our transportation system is very closely tied into what's happening uh, in, in the kind of climate emergency. So um, it was a variety of reasons I wanted to make sure that we, we had space uh, and time for you to kind of offer your thoughts on this bill, but also um, bring, you know, uh, some of the things that are going on with Capstone right now, which we're eager to hear about as well. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. And as you know, we record our hearings for the record, so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Absolutely. I um, really want to thank you for inviting me and kind of envision this maybe more as a discussion than, yeah. than sort of just me testifying. But uh, for the record, I am Sue Minter, the Executive Director of Capstone Community Action which is an anti-poverty organization in uh, central Vermont, which really includes the counties of Orange, a few towns in Windsor, uh, Washington County, and Lamoille County. And Capstone is one of a network of community action agencies across the state, one of five. And we are a network called VCAP. Um, I am here testifying really on behalf of myself and, as you say, some of my past experience. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning. Uh, and I also, um, so I'm not testifying on behalf of VCAP, the network, yeah. but definitely okay. representing Capstone. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to just start out because um, driving here, I was listening to the radio as I tend to, and I learned that. Um, Yesterday, which happened to have been my birthday, the doomsday clock was moved. And now the doomsday clock, you may recall, was really about the atomic energy. And it is uh, put forward by the Atomic Energy, not commission, scientists. Bulletin the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Anyway, we are now 100 seconds to midnight by... Um, in the view of these scientists, and that incorporates both the threat of nuclear war and of climate change. So what I heard on the radio this morning was it's time to wake up, which I thought was good because I didn't necessarily get a great night's sleep. So I thought I'd wake up for you. But just a reminder that this is a global emergency that I'm really pleased that you are taking seriously and thinking um, I guess across sectors, um, long term and sort of short term. And I uh, do want to, and I, as I point out in my testimony, um, I appreciate your bringing some of my past experience here. Secretary of VTrans, um, also uh, Irene, and I think when we are talking about uh, resilience and planning, um, I think the experience we had in Irene is the closest we've come to really what uh, severe, intense, extreme storm looks like. Um, and I did experience or learn in that experience that it is um, lowest income folks who are really the most vulnerable. They're often located in the highest risk areas um, in, in structures such as mobile homes um, that are uh, the least resilient, and in addition, they have the hardest time recovering. Um, so I appreciate many pieces of your bill. I'm really here to offer sort of friendly amendments uh, and to support your efforts. I um, also <coughs> had the experience um, when I was, so my experience is I was at the um, transportation agency as the deputy secretary when Irene hit, and during that first four month period, which we consider the emergency phase, it was really logistics and response. Um, after that phase, we moved into what they call the recovery phase, both the short and long-term recovery, and that's when I was appointed to become 
uh, in charge of. You know, I would say that we were incredibly poorly equipped and unprepared for Irene. And um, one of the reasons I'm so pleased uh, that you are thinking in the way that this bill does by bringing together a council that is cross-sector and longer term in its horizon is because I worry a lot. Um, we learned so many lessons in Irene and from Irene. We tried to record them. Um, we did a little bit of structural change within our government uh, to at least have a, a position and a little post within the Department of Environment, uh, Emergency Management who's thinking about mitigation and resilience. Um, and we are certainly more prepared simply because of what we learned during that disaster. But I, I hope that we can use this opportunity to incorporate some of those lessons learned. Um, I did also have the really extraordinary opportunity uh, when I was redeployed back to uh, VTRANS, uh, the state of Vermont was asked to join an initiative of the Obama administration, the uh, climate, ta the Task Force on Climate Preparedness and Resilience. So this was, uh, and I was lucky enough to represent Vermont, really our governor at that, in that position, which meant I was joined by 26 other uh, governors, mayors, county commissioners, uh, uh, tribal land leaders from across the country, all these different jurisdictions, and trying to really combine and coalesce our lessons learned um, into a report. Um, it was an extraordinary year and a half experience. I was then co-chairing a subcommittee that really talked about sort of recommendations for FEMA. It worries me that all of these good lessons, um, I don't know where they sit anymore. Um, it was impressive that the entire cabinet uh, of the former president actually attended our convenings and that every single cabinet member had climate preparedness um, in at one of the top uh, things they're doing. So, so I worry that we're becoming increasingly unprepared. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, by key elements of your plan. I did learn a little bit at a forum uh, a couple nights ago that you know other states in our region are adopting similar approaches. Um, I guess. I start by just in my testimony saying I very much appreciate that you do include uh, marginalized and disadvantaged uh, Vermonters uh, or their representatives in your thinking uh, for exactly the reason uh, that I shared and I hadn't realized that the IPPC report actually referenced the disproportionate impact on these communities and um, especially because the folks who lack insurance and lack resources will be the ones who the state worries the most about and spends the most on if they are so inclined, which I think our state really was following Irene, uh, the more that we can be prepared, the lower those costs are. So I think there's an economic argument, frankly, to becoming more prepared uh, in a broad sense. I do really support um, incorporating some clear enforceable um, reduction requirements. Um, I was a member of this body along with many others in the room, or at least some. Uh, Representative Sherman and I shared a, a seat on the Transportation Committee. Um, and when we, I think, first adopted this legislation, I think we set forth um, goals, and I think it's hard to achieve goals when they aren't really uh, staring you front in the face. And I don't think we as a state have um, uh, figured out good constructive ways to measure uh, where we are relative to where we want to be in a consistent way and thereby think about strategies to um, reduce. So I can't uh, possibly think to testify about what the right targets are, but I've certainly seen and, and I did uh, as a graduate student study uh, environmental policy and at that time watched very serious positive impacts under the Clean Air Act um, by mandating um, emission reductions and with targets um, and in certain states and I certainly think of, of California who have already started adopting greenhouse gas emission requirement reductions as part of their air quality 
uh, infrastructure um, have really seen differences. So I support that. It's not going to be easy, but I think it's the right approach. Um, one recommendation that I'd like to make about the council um, and is really in the structure and, and who you have as the chair. And again, I think this is um, my experience uh, after Irene. So I would recommend that you actually have the secretary of the AG agency of administration chairing that council. Um, you know, when I was the Irene recovery officer and I followed Neil Lunderville in that position. He was there in the most intense first four months. Um, and he had been the Secretary of Administration. And he, in that experience, understood in, in a way that few others could uh, the levers of power and influence and how to conduct significant response. Um, I learned then by being within uh, the agency of administration just how much, you know, when you are an, a secretary of one agency, to you are on a parallel. Um, you there, you are not above the others, and um, unless you have someone who is has the authority to actually oversee uh, those other agencies, I, I don't think it's effective. Um, I learned that, you know, I was uh, in the Irene Recovery Office, and I think Neil Lunderville specifically set it up this way because of his understanding, having been in that position, that the Secretary and Agency of Administration oversees all of state government on behalf of the governor. It's separate from the governor's chief of staff and staff. It's really responsible for government. And I created, we created a, a multi-sector interagency, essentially, cabinet around Irene. And I think because we had, I had the authority of the Secretary of Administration, um, I was able to be more effective. And, and that's why I suggest you consider um, that structure. Um, the couple of people who I think you may want to add to um, your membership, um, the regional planning uh, folks, uh, VACTA, I think are very important. I didn't see them at least on the draft that I had. And They're not on there. Yeah. Um, you know, after Irene, and certainly, okay, I, I, I have to say I have a degree in planning. I believe in planning, but I think what this council is about is trying to plan for our state, and we certainly relied tremendously on the Regional Planning Commissions uh, to undertake a lot on behalf of their member states. So that makes some sense to me. Um, the other uh, thing, I don't know whether it makes sense, but at least you should hear from um, the Department of Public Service. One of the recommendations we made after Irene that was not adopted was that um, the emergency management leader actually become higher up within the cabinet and a member of cabinet. Many other states do that, and those are states who are much more used to having emergencies to respond to. Can you just walk, so say right, that again? So yeah. right now, um, we have, you know, you have the agency of administration and then you have um, the, Department of Public Safety, and within that you have an, a, di a division of emergency management. So that person and, and group is really the ones who understand and they have relationships with FEMA and they um, are schooled in that field of work, but also are, have a lot more practice in emergency response and drills. They, they, and they're just so far from the cabinet. And that is not the case in many other states, I observed. And elevating it. I had recommended that, but it wasn't adopted. Um, and But we did create a position, um, actually, which is still there. Um, we had never had someone in that at that time really full-time focused on mitigation and resilience planning. Wow. This is pre-2010 Pre-2011, yeah. Um, <coughs> we, we have a very, um, you know, we're frugal, let's put it that way. And 
we haven't had to respond to emergencies of that scale, had we ever before. And we were, I would say, under-resourced in that area and not uh, nearly as um, educated as many of our neighbor states in everything that is expected of us by FEMA, by our federal agencies. By contrast, I was running the Agency of Transportation. Um, our federal agency was the Federal Highway Administration. We are very, I would say, well resourced in the Agency of Transportation relative to many other states in uh, state agencies and departments in Vermont. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we have federal uh, dollars and that we understand, and that, that, that the transportation world understands what it takes to, to do the incredibly important work. Um, but because of our partnership with Federal Highway, they were right with us every step of the way. We were interagency. Um, so the damage that was done, and there were 600 miles of roads completely wiped out overnight. The damage that was done to the state highway had federal resources and an entire infrastructure to support how did we manage that in an entirely different way to get emergency funding. But significantly, so, and then all of the infrastructure that the towns, the, the culverts and roads, let alone the, you know, buildings and homes and lo business loss, but just the infrastructure, for example, um, totally different federal agencies, totally different um, mm -hmm. practices and standards. And we were able to implement uh, very different uh, standards in the way we responded, the, the size of the bridges and culverts that we built after Irene, the Federal Highway Administration supported. Uh, they went out, we went out on tours together, understanding why we were doing this. It was a much larger investment and they supported and funded it. I mean, we had our battles, but, but they were agreed to. The challenge after Irene was with FEMA and every one of our towns, uh, especially in some parts of the state that were desperately tiny towns, um, impacted by eight times the cost of their annual, full annual budget. Right. But the town, but the FEMA organization said, no, we're not paying for larger culverts. We're not, and we got into a situation where we actually, the government, you know, we adopted larger codes and standards that we required the, the towns to use. And FEMA said, we're not paying for that. So literally for two years, we battled um, legal battles. And, and FEMA is not, um, does not respond to a court. You can only appeal inside FEMA. So we had appeals to the local level, and then we went down to Boston, and then we went to Washington, and, uh, and it went beyond that. And thankfully, because we have uh, a senator, uh, two senators with very strong um, relationships at that time, right, with, right up to the president, but we had advocates going to the head of FEMA, and we had calls to the president of the United States in order to get the dollars for our towns, for our state hospital, for our state complex, for major things. It was a political battle, sadly. Um, but at the very basic core, we didn't have the ability to offer our towns and even FEMA the kind of information and training and understanding of what you're, what's expected of you. So that's what I see coming out of this, hopefully. A lot of lessons were learned. We do have people now who are trained in that for our state government. Um, I don't think we are probably resourced enough at our, fed, at our regional planning commissions and elsewhere to continue that work. Just as one example, now there are some plans that you require here. Every town is supposed to do a mitigation plan. When FEMA hit, almost nobody had done it. And so we very quickly, and then we couldn't start getting the dollars flowing until they had adopted and approved these plans, and it was a nightmare. Um, so it's the kind of work that must happen for us to get expeditious dollars. Now I worry if we were to um, suffer from a disaster at this time, where we don't necessarily have an administration who will <coughs> kind of upon our state the way we did at that time, and I think the budgets are so much tighter than even they were then for disasters, I worry that the way in which FEMA was willing to weight and help may not be acceptable. So being prepared means a lot of things. 
right down to every town having an approved disaster mitigation plan, um, which I think you'll get to. Sue, can I ask a question? Yes. So the person that you got into emergency management? Yes, he's was, still there. And their, their role is? You'll have to ask, because I, you know, I just remember, uh, I think that the position's title is um, is um, disaster mitigation and, and resilience or something. I, I'm sorry that I don't yeah, actually okay. know. We called it something, and I think it's still that, and, and they're doing a lot of work. When I spoke to, I spoke to emergency management this summer Good. about Good. this bill and, you know, where they're at and their capacity, and one of the things that they had noted was they don't have as much capacity as they need to help towns get those hazard mitigation plans yeah. written because towns are, you know, a lot of volunteer towns, yes, as you know. Mm -hmm. So, was it that? Do you know if it was that type of yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. disaster mitigation planning and yeah. preparedness? So, there's all kinds of trainings that you know. What does FEMA expect? Uh, I, I'm sorry that I okay. I don't it's not have the really details um, really in my head, but it is exactly that kind of work that is very basic that we were completely under prepared for before Irene and. We tried to make adjustments to help us be more prepared, but at this moment, I don't know where we sit. What was the what was the difference in um, reimbursement from FEMA? With it, whether you well, had it a, went literally pound by plan. pound. I mean, there's a, a lot of things. We are, one of the first battles that uh, we had to wage was getting to what they call the 90%. Mm -hmm. So instead of having the feds pay 75%, we got to that. So that was battle royale number one. But every single uh, in major investment was a battle and a negotiation and very crazy making. But um, but I, I literally every single I, I mean I'll take the town of Bennington. Um, really extraordinary that they had because the Roaring Brook had already flooded so many times. They had gotten um, federal funding, FEMA funding, hazard mitigation funding to recover in a way that was resilient. So, you know, we've learned that you can't just build trenches. We have to think about the velocity of the moving water. And so we know that rivers meander. And so we try to replicate that in the way we now uh, respond to flooding. And that's because of the really leading edge um, <coughs> river fluvial geomorphologists that we have in our Agency of Natural Resources with whom the transportation agency has also learned and we are really working together on how to res respond in a more resilient fashion. And, and I would welcome you to invite Michelle Boomhauer and her team to share with you the resilience planning that the agency has done uh, thanks to support from the Federal Highway Administration. And, and I think you should learn about that because it's, it's relevant. And I mentioned it in one of my recommendations, but um, the town of Bennington had a two million dollar uh, investment in how they properly responded in resilient fashion uh, when the Roaring Brook to, uh, was decimated, and we had photographs, and we had the geologists, and we had, and and, and FEMA said no, I'm not paying for that. So a two million dollar for the town of Bennington is just an extraordinary impact. So we had. Uh, to get the Senate, so Senator Leahy got uh, some of the staffers to come and take a tour. I went to Washington and talked directly to the FEMA staff. I mean, it took, and, and then we had to do these appeals. And actually, um, a member of Michelle Boomhauer's team was at that, who's, who's now our, your environmental planner and policy, uh, was the attorney. You might be interested to get his testimony, because it, it is telling what we had to do we deployed attorneys from the Attorney General, from the Agency of Transportation. We spent enormous resources to battle with FEMA on how, to, why they should pay for us to do exactly what the plans that it, the mitigation part of FEMA had said we should do. We won. Bennington got the money. Uh, the town, town by town, we battled on the culvert sizing. It's an extraordinary story, and it is. It is the mindset of FEMA not to be doing that, and I think it has to do with the fact that they don't have the money. Yep. Which I expect is exacerbated today. Mm -hmm. So, the, however, the more prepared you are with your mitigation plans, and the more you can, the, the other issue was mapping. 
Uh, we were relying on 20-year-old maps of fa from FEMA that were inundation maps, and they weren't fluvial erosion maps. And what we now know is our threat is the river overflowing and the unbelievable damage that it will do. It is not you know, slow-moving floods that then recede. And our Agency of Natural Resources had gotten funding from FEMA to do that kind of mapping, and we had high hazards. So in the town of Jamaica, we had homes that were ripped away by that river. I think it was five homes. And we could not get them funded for the buyout, even though they met, because they were on the high hazard map that our Agency of Natural Resources had already set, but they weren't on the FEMA inundation map. Mm -hmm. And it is just the lack of preparedness and planning and clarity that allows FEMA to say no until we battle back. So I went down a path I didn't expect to even talk to you about, but it's relevant. <laughs> um, and it's almost like PTSD to have these uh, memories of, of the battle. And it, 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 it was very, very, very difficult. And it isn't that, uh, that the people who work for FEMA are not very caring, hardworking people. I think uh, they have sometimes got their hands tied behind their back, and it's because we don't always have the funding available. And the battle for the funding, unfortunately, uh, became a political battle, and 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 we were successful, and it was it was a lot of work. So those were some of the things that I didn't expect to talk to you about. Um, and uh, I will just say, you know, one of the other things I got to do was help uh, just uh, send a team lead a team, really, of uh, folks from transportation to Colorado after their flooding. So their flooding was very similar to ours. And we, the whole transportation world, and I was the head of uh, something called NASTO, the Northeast Association of State Transportation Officials, and we started a whole discussion um, around resilient infrastructure. So the world of transportation has uh, learned a lot and is really moving forward on thinking differently about how we build and where we build. In Colorado, um, we recommended to them to have their uh, recovery team also really tied at the governor's office at the highest level of state government. And I think because of that, they, like us, I think, were quite successful. I, I really can't uh, say enough about the difference between being uh, really in the top tier of government versus having a chair of a council that's really on the, on the same level as, as every other of their cohorts. It's harder for everyone. Um, I have a few more comments in there um, that you can read. Uh, I think I've sort of covered the main points. And uh, again, these were just friendly amendments with suggestions. Uh, some is wording about adding social equity, uh, including public health and housing stock into a section that I think you didn't have. Um, making sure as you think about what's required that you are aware of the town requirement now and learning that it isn't well uh, resourced doesn't surprise me, but it does worry me. Um, and that's what this council, I think, can help bring to light. So that probably talked plenty. Oh, that's correct. I a question. Mm. Okay. Go ahead. So one of the pieces that we have in here is the creation of a vulnerability index to yes. help us kind of understand which communities are most likely going to need help just with doing this planning or they're just going to be overwhelmed with that. So we were surprised to find that the Agency of Health has a, has a socioeconomic vulnerability index for the state. I don't know if you were aware of that or not. You know, I didn't remember that. I think there's been a lot of post-Irene work that I haven't been tuned into. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the Department of Health was involved with me and us uh, on that Obama task force. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of good thinking and engagement um, by the health department at that time. So I'm thrilled to hear that. And mm -hmm. that's very interesting and relevant. Mm -hmm. um, the mapping, again, the transportation agency has done a very good mapping uh, of our, our infrastructure vulnerability uh, relative to our river system, our fluvial um, geomorphology, and, and has a prioritization system. I actually got to uh, present that at a national uh, climate resilience um, 
Department of, it's a National Transportation uh, Resilience um, Conference, I think it was a year ago. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe it was two years ago, I think that was two years ago. Um, but anyway, we've done a lot of thinking um, with the support of the federal government to actually map our vulnerabilities and I think that all of the different mappings that may be going on uh, may already be put together in some way, um, but uh, if they're not, that's a great thing. And if they are, then that's the resource the council can begin to really utilize, because while we're mapping and we even have a way of prioritizing, I don't know if we've adopted those priorities and thought about the investments that need to be made and and the str being strategic about getting going. Right. That's what's not, I To reduce think. the dollar growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's about which bridge, you know, we've thought about redundancies. When this bridge goes down, okay. Um, and so it's a very complicated formula of thinking about, okay, what do we need to do next and, and why? Mm -hmm. um, specifically to make ourselves stronger for the future. Okay. Can I keep going? You can. Mike wants to get in oh. here, too. Oh, okay. I'll wait. But if, if you want uh, to continue on well, this, Well, I, this I actually, um, around the, so one of the, um, one of the climate change um, uh, activities that sometimes concerns me, coming from rural areas, and is, a, is thinking about cost effective, right? So, of course, we need to do that. We need to be responsible. But cost effective when we're mitigating climate change really screams to me like, let's get, you know, as few cars as possible in the cities. Um, you know, it. it it screams to me of increasing pressure in the rural areas. And so I'm wondering if you have, given your experience working in a lot of devastated rural areas, if you, can, if you have any thoughts about how to balance that well. So thinking about cost effective, but also most vulnerable. I think the things that I think about the most with the rural areas um, is both the infrastructure, and I know that we've done a lot of planning and thinking about that, but it's where people are living relative to the, the flooding that's going to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and the incredibly hard choice of, of, of suggesting that people move elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we did do that after Irene, and um, this was another, you know, that's what we had hoped to get federal money for in Jamaica. But, um, you know, thankfully in Jamaica, um, the philanthropic community stepped in in a tremendous way to help those families. But there are whole areas that we've mapped that we know really are higher risk and we should be talking about buyouts. And some of the funding, we still have a, a pot of money, and this is stuff you should learn more about and I'm not sure I get clear, but we have mitigation funding, sort of a percentage of every um, federally declared disaster a pot goes into a pot for thinking about how to utilize these funds. So probably there is good strategic thinking going on. Uh, you know, the Department of Environmental of Emergency Management is okay. thinking about this stuff. Okay. But I think a lot more about the, the, the folks at risk in, because of their homes than sort of where the cars, I'm not sure what you mean about that, but I do know that the folks who plan our infrastructure are thinking a lot about that, and mm -hmm. I'm confident that continues. But well, the mm -hmm. housing and getting people to move or not build mm -hmm. in high-risk areas, mm -hmm. and you know, that becomes the issue of insurance, and that's another really and difficult conversation. As we're dealing with, you know, as we're, as we're looking to deal more aggressively with climate change, um, and reduce our emissions, but also protect our people mm. and dealing with the effects right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to make sure that we don't set up a competing, you know, interest thing around reducing emissions mm. and our, you know, protecting our folks that are dealing with mm -hmm. climate change right now. Mm -hmm. Is that... Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not really clear. Sorry, I was going totally into the thinking of, of planning and resilience, yes. and not so much the impacts of mitigation. Yeah, yeah, and emission reductions. Well, I'm thinking a lot in my work at Capstone uh, about different ways to invest in, um, you know, low-income communities. Um, with uh, how do we get people around differently? Um, how do we you know, your body supported the effort to, to help um, reduce emissions by getting lower income folks, helping them get subsidized to purchase used high efficiency vehicles. Uh, so 
getting off the road, uh, what many, many low-income people rely on is gas-guzzling, high polluting vehicles, but uh, helping to subsidize them to get into the used high-efficiency car market. So that's a very small example of something that last year you all passed in your mm -hmm. T-bill um, that we're working with the Transportation Agency to implement. Um, and I'm hoping that that's a program that you'll continue to fund uh, beyond uh, this one year. It was a one-time fund from the VW settlement, so hopefully there will be a conversation and I'll be talking to others in the building about that. And it's just one example. And we are also working with the Agency of Transportation on um, a, a very new program that the Federal Highway Administration is rolling out called Mobility for All. Um, you know, we have, um, invested, I think, mightily for a rural state in our public transit system. Um, I learn now uh, with the folks that uh, we serve that have access to no transportation and are literally trapped in poverty uh, due to the lack of access. So we're looking to um, purchase uh, or, or create a, an all-electric fleet of vehicles to uh, help get rides for people so they can go to work because mm -hmm. our large employers can't find people and they're in our doors but they can't get there. Uh, people to get to their health care appointments, so which the hospitals are now uh, very concerned of the number of people who aren't showing up. People get to their recovery, so we're trying to think locally about a system that uses electric transportation to meet the very desperate needs of folks in, in rural poverty. Yeah, so, um, thanks for your expertise. Your expertise is a gold mine of information on it. It's a little old and rusty, but <laughs> I can pull it out. Gold never rusts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, no, but I mean, uh, it's uh, amazing to hear, hear your uh, accounts of what, what it took to get funding from FEMA. Um, anyway, uh, where I was going to go, though, as, as Director of FEMA, uh, of Capstone, you uh, you do have programs that help people save money by reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and heating and transportation and such like that. Um, tell me about the backlog of people that are requesting assistance uh, with weatherization and uh, aren't able to get it. Do you have a lot of backlog there? Or? Yes, we have definite waiting lists. And we have waiting lists and we do not advertise. <laughs> the only way that people know I'm, is, honestly, last year, and I want to thank this committee, I know you um, really supported efforts to um, increase the amount of weatherization um, funding that we have. And even just the debate, we got a spike in phone calls. Um, and that we can't really meet the demand. But, you know, part of what's challenging is, you know, in order to meet that demand, we have to hire new folks and we have to really build out our um, base of employees. And unless we know that that's going to be a consistent, uh, and, and honestly, there's probably another expert in this room <laughs> who could speak much more about this, but uh, it's a little bit... We, we want to grow, uh, but we can't start uh, hiring those folks unless we know there's a real growth path. Um, I cannot testify exactly how many people are on a waiting list. Um, I know that we're constantly having to triage and prioritize who it is we will serve first uh, by a very complicated but important formula, and I know we're not meeting the need. And, and one part of it is... Uh, People up to 80% of area median income are eligible, but people below 60% are prioritized, so the people between 60 and 80 essentially never get served. Right. That's, thank you for reminding me of that. So the only way to approach that is by increasing investment. Yes. Well, we definitely, um, I do have, I hope, um, just a four-minute video maybe to close up and talk sure. about a little bit of yeah. what we do. You have four minutes. Look at that. I noticed that. <laughs> but I thank you um, really for inviting us into this room uh, and even more so inviting uh, representatives of the folks we serve onto this council. Um, and look forward to continuing the conversation. <coughs> Happy to be a resource in any way. Yeah, no, I hope, hope we get a chance to have you back. So this is just a video to give you a sense of what it is we do, um, because um, 
What I've learned in my just over a year is that we have an extraordinary um, challenge of people in poverty who um, who are needing support, whether it's food, heat, or housing, um, that we do vital assistance for, but that we actually can help people get out of poverty. And that's the thing I feel is the most important work we do. We, we, we support people in crisis, but we also have very innovative strategies to help people get economic and self-sufficiency. Um, so this is a little portrayal of what we do. Thanks. My wife gets a check one week. I get one you know, a couple weeks later, and then I get one from the VA. It's just, you know, you've got to plan all your money for each pay period. I didn't do a whole lot of good. I did a lot of drinking, and I wasn't able to maintain jobs or relationships. I really didn't feel like I had much opportunity. A lot of people right now, their income is so limited and they really cannot mix, make ends meet. I made the mistake of marrying to support for my family and got myself into a very bad relationship. I did 22 years in prison and I got out here. I didn't understand the seriousness of what I had forfeit, not knowing that my life was gonna be changed forever that I wasn't going to never raise my son or be a father to my child. I'm 71 years old and my wife and I are both retired and we're raising grandchildren, so my parents just weren't able to, to raise their children and raise them properly. And DCF stepped in and took them away from them and gave them to us. As a single mother, it was, it was really hard. Uh, I lost apartments and I had to choose between feeding my kids or clothing them. I was homeless a lot of the time. We stayed in cars or couch surf. Without a second chance, what could we do besides go back to the old things that we used to do? We were struggling with, you know, we got handed three kids and financially it started getting harder and harder and harder. I wanted more. I wanted to open a business. I wanted to be more successful. I wanted a better life for my son. The program is there. The opportunity is there. It's providing jobs for others. People want to help, so you take it, you do it, you run with it. It's, it's an amazing program. It gave me the steps. It, it was somebody right there with me, walking beside me, to guide me through to say that I've now owned my business for 11 years. Capstone was like a key to a door I was trying to get through. They like orchestrated the right moves it made me see that, okay, I can do this. I can be a cook for real. Whether it is the food shelf or the cooking class, or help with the taxes, there's hope. Yeah, Capstone is my foundation of support. If, when they did the, our furnace, they told us it would save us about half of what our fuel was of prior year. I'm relieved that I'm going to be able to do more with the grandkids. I've come a long way, and my children have seen it, and there's plenty of opportunity. And that's really what Capstone has done. I mean, isn't that the American dream, really? To go be what you want, and do what you want, and be successful, be happy in your career. And Capstone's given me that. I had hope to get out of prison, you know, and I made it. I, I had hope to make it up here to Vermont. I did it. You know, I hope to get a job, I got it. You know, Costco on giving people a way out of a difficult situation. I, I say empowerment quite a bit because they do empower you to be better. And Capstone has always been that stepping stone for me to get to that next level of confidence. I'm able to do so much more and help so many people because of Capstone. I am president of Policy Council and part of the Head Start program. With what I started with, which was not much, except for the desire to have my own business, that I was able to get that help, receive that help. It's fantastic. Team, it's a team of things working together to accomplish one goal. And that goal is, you know what I'm saying, that to live and to have better, and to want better, and to do better. 
can't do that without a team. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing that. That guy's in stuff. Yeah, yeah, you'd be mad at him. Yeah, it's cool. Thanks for your work, everybody. I know it's hard. I know you're working hard, and I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for joining us early, Sue. Yeah, yeah it was an easy commute. Thank you for making time for us today. Um, uh, we're in the middle of considering the Global Warming Solutions Act, or I think you know, H688, and um, I know that you have some um, thoughts to share with us about that in representing the Associated Industries of Vermont. And I uh, wanted to welcome you here and thank you for your patience and waiting for us to get off the floor. And uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for the record um, as we record our hearing. Absolutely. So my name is William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. We represent primarily the manufacturing sector in the state uh, and certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about this legislation and hope to uh, continue to engage with you folks going forward. Um, you know, I'd like to maybe address some sort of high level issues uh, today and certainly follow up with um, further comments in writing and more specifics and obviously um, you know, engage in some of, the, some of the questions and answers and discussions as you folks try to uh, you know, figure your way forward uh, with this legislation. So I just want to maybe start by putting into context, it's not that it shouldn't probably be pretty obvious where we're coming from, um, but just uh, the perspective we're trying to bring to some of the issues and the specifics in the bill here. Um, you know, for us, this issue is not, these issues, because obviously this is a broad and complex uh, topic, you know, it's not about whether or not to have climate policies. Our primary focus is um, how do we have the most reasonable and balanced uh, policies are one of our concerns, not, not surprisingly, is trying to avoid uh, undue economic harms, but also harnessing uh, positive economic opportunities as well as we you know, get into eventually what are details and specific proposals. Uh, because however, however important climate priorities are, obviously there are many critical priorities that, that we're all charged uh, with trying to address. Um, and although climate and economic priorities don't have to be in conflict and often aren't, uh, there are always the possibility that they can be when you get down into specifics. Um, so that's the perspective that I have some sort of basic comments or recommendations, both on the Climate Council itself and sort of how it's set up, but then also uh, the sort of implementation um, and accountability provisions uh, further on in the bill. Um, with regard to the Council, and again, from the perspective of trying to make sure that you're getting the, the, the the kind, of, the kind of perspectives, the kind of balance uh, input that I think is important, both in putting forward um, things that you ought to do and things you ought to avoid. Um, obviously, there are a lot of uh, perspectives and stakeholder uh, um, uh, groups represented already and was proposed, um, but I think it could be uh, could be adjusted to be um, uh, include additional representation that I think is important to the to the topic. Uh, the first thing. Is that, if I recall correctly, you have farm and forestry combined as one representative. Um, and I think, honestly, a lot of both the challenges and opportunities in farming and in forestry are not necessarily the same. And I think it would be beneficial to separate those two and have one from each. Um, second, having a representative from the manufacturing and industrial uh, perspective, I think, would be helpful. Obviously, a lot of uh, emission concerns and economic concerns and opportunities uh, stem from manufacturing and, industri and industrial activity. So, I think having uh, somebody from that uh, that sector would be an important ingredient. And similarly, uh, transportation and freight uh, providers. Um, you know, from our perspective, obviously, our areas of either concern or opportunity are not just not just uh, uh, operations and facilities in Vermont. But as you folks know fully well, uh, a big chunk of our emissions portfolio is transportation based and um, the hauling of supplies and goods, uh, primarily over the roads in Vermont, um, is, a, is both a big part of that issue, but also very critical to our operations. Um, and so having folks that can speak to those, those, uh, those issues is important. And that's not necessarily entirely within the manufacturing sector, 
a lot of that activity uh, operates on its own in terms of a in terms of a, a, a business sector. So, so th those would be the primary uh, sort of membership uh, question uh, recommendations. The other one, which obviously you provide some you know some flexibility in the subcommittee structure and approach, um, but I think it would be we think it would be helpful if um, in addition to I think. I think you have two subcommittees specifically cited in, in the bill. It would also be helpful to have one that's specifically charged with looking at avoiding or mitigating um, economic harm, but also realizing economic benefits from, again, uh, the interaction between whatever proposals come forward and and uh, you know, and businesses uh, in the state. I think that's an important part of the overall discussion. I think having a subcommittee that makes sure that that's that's really looked at, I think, would be helpful as well. Um, one question I have, and this maybe speaks to the sort of next area of, of suggestions, is um, also the question of the, de the decision-making uh, mechanisms of the council. Um, you know, anybody who's ever put together, served on, or sat in the same room as uh, study committees and things like that that the legislature puts forward. The whole question of do you have the right mix of people and do you have a fair decision making process is is a very difficult one to to get right and to figure out. Um, and unless I missed it, I don't think that this really <coughs> speaks to exactly how the council will make its decisions. Like for example, you know, uh, majority consensus unanimity. Um, you know, that could be a factor in in. in you know, the, how the sort of the quality and the reception of their final product uh, could affect that. Although I, I think that can be addressed um, with with what we, were, what we would propose on the implementation side. Um, so, unless anybody has any, I, mean, I think hopefully fairly straightforward. But if anybody has any questions about anything recommended so far, <laughs> you are accurate. There is not in here a, a mechanism that says. Here's what the vote count is, for example. Right. Uh, right. If, you know, if it was that straightforward in terms of adopting the plan, so you're right. Um, so what we would recommend, uh, the next part, which obviously has to do with deadlines and schedules and, um, and frankly, the cause of action and, and role of, of the courts, uh, which we have concerns about, about that for a number of reasons. What we would really recommend is rather than what you have uh, on the implementation side in the bill right now is you have the council make make the recommendations and reports that they are required to do, but have those not simply submitted to the legislature, but require their approval by the legislature. Um, that I think, uh, first of all, I, given the, the balance of considerations that need to go into specific proposals. I think having that go through the legislative process is both important and, and reasonable. Um, that can also serve, frankly, to be a filter or, or if you will, for um, the other challenges of trying to make the council the perfect representative, representative body uh, with, you know, with the best process for approval. Um, I think similarly to how we don't have study committees and working groups go straight from report to law, or rule, um, yeah, there, there is a good reason why those those go through the legislative process. And I think, um, given the significance of the, of the issue and the and the policies and proposals that are likely to be coming forward, it's all all that much more important that those should be approved by the legislature. Excuse me. Sure. Just looking for clarification on what it is that should be approved. You said that the, so we require reports. Mm -hmm. Is that what should be approved, or are you looking? Is it before that, is it so no rule involved in the rulemaking? Right. Well, so um, you know, say the council's recommendations include the, the obvious one would be would be legislative changes, but also uh, specific rules uh, that um, that the agency would be required to put forward. That the legislature would either adopt the legislative proposals, or if there's specific rule direction and authority that's recommended, that the legislature. Um, approves that. So. Similarly to how now the legislature passes laws that require rules for, for implementation. 
So it would give an opportunity for the legislature to review the, the actual specific proposals and, and approve them. Um, and if necessary, maybe make adjustments you know, if, there's, if they see that there's good reason to do so. Um, yeah, and I think, and again, I think this addresses some questions whether, you know, in the, in the collective judgment of the legislature, whether the, uh, the, the council has gotten everything right in terms of balancing uh, priorities or specifics. Also addresses the question of, of you know, the, getting that balance of representation and fairness in decision making. Um, uh, correct as well. And I don't think that, I don't see why um, having that legislative approval step would necessarily really slow the overall um, schedule or progress of what you're trying to achieve. I don't think um, that, uh, yeah, I don't think the timing or the substance or, or the merits of, of what's done would, would change by requiring legislative approval. Um, and I think you might be able to achieve some balance and judgment that sort of a more sort of I want to say ham-fisted in a clumsy way, but more of a more sort of strict way that that court intervention might be might uh, might lead to um, in terms of input and considerations that are that are uh, brought to play. Um, I think, frankly, sometimes, especially if you look at um, you know court intervention. Um, where there's maybe some delay in, in the council's recommendations or a delay in the rulemaking. Sometimes there's good reason for those delays. It's not necessarily something that warrants a court case uh, just because you're off by a, couple, by a month or a couple months or whatnot. Uh, there may be practical reasons for that. Uh, and I think having the legislative approval process allows some, some more flexibility and not having such a sensitive trigger on that. Um, and also, when it comes to meeting the goals and having cases brought to the court to uh, have the court direct rulemaking, I think that raises questions in that kind of a context. Are you gonna have the same sort of public input process that you would have in the normal rulemaking process? Are you gonna have um, a consideration of different of different perspectives? And, um, and also some judgment in terms of weighing the pros and cons <coughs> of, of specific proposals. I think having the legislature really driving that um, allows for that much better than setting up a situation where um, where if you're off uh, you know by a percentage point or two or more uh, on those target deadlines um, I think it's a little more again it's a more it's much more of a, of a blunt uh, instrument to use the courts um, and I think if, if you try to come up with guardrails or other ways to try to moderate that or, or mitigate that, what you're really doing is you're getting closer and closer to replicating what might be um, a legislative process anyway, so might as well stick with that from, from the outside. Um, so that's, that's a very general area of, of recommendations. Um, there are very some more specific things, just before we loop back to that. Um, one thing I try, I'm hoping to Think about more and come back more. Um, the bill makes reference to maintaining um, net zero emissions across sectors uh, after 2050, and I think we would like to sort of consider more what that might mean um, in terms of, say, for example, um, you know, business activity or, or manufacturing activity that has a, obviously has a has a greenhouse gas footprint, regardless of how efficient you might be. Could be written into a situation where you could have, you know, a state-of-the-art facility, but if you, if God forbid, we actually have more manufacturing expansion here in Vermont, are you run into situations where simply expanding activities that we might all want for various reasons might run, might run counter to a to again a net zero concept? And part of that, to be frank, I need to talk to more people about when we say net zero, what we really mean yep. in terms of specifics. Can I just mention something sure, about absolutely. that? Because I think it's actually relevant to a number of your members. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think some of the consideration of this uh, is reflected in looking at what uh, New York has attempted to do. And part of the New York law um, acknowledges
acknowledges that there are sectors in the economy that are going to be um, really challenged. Uh, it's not clear what the technological path is um, to, you know, to completely eliminate, you know, in, in 30 years, um, fossil fuel uh, um, as, as part of the fuel mix and greenhouse gas emissions as, as part of a manufacturing process for site. Not specific to manufacturing, right, right, right. as an example. Um, sure. And I think what New York has tried to do is provide a path, very strict and narrow, as to you know for industries that have difficulty getting there, um, finding where there is mitigation through other means. Um, that you know there may be industries they can't get you know off the fossil fuel, make it, may be able to reduce but not eliminate. And whether it's you know just generally speaking through sequestration means or, you know, or other can get to net zero, mm -hmm. um, even while they still may be emitting. But it's a very prescribed and narrow path. But, right. you know, that was one of the concepts that was embedded in the, in the New York legislation. Mm -hmm. So it's something we can talk about more. But I, um, I think it's very relevant to probably some of the people that you represent. Yeah, and certainly if we're talking about goals and aspirations, and trying to find ways mm -hmm. forward, you know, that, I think that allows some flexibility as we get closer. Obviously, it's hard to predict where we're going to be in 2050 today. Yeah. And whether we're, if we're blocking ourselves into some things today that may not really work, that you know, there could be some challenges. Um, that actually, I need to get back to another thing on that. But one other, um, one other aspect, which again, I'd, I'd like to come back to you folks on, but just want to sort of flag now on page 23, line 18, which is the only line reference I was going to make um, in energy, uh, energy policy uh, and planning currently energy policy is based on a concept of least cost um, things which includes environmental um, priorities which I think would, would cover greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, this bill would set greenhouse gas reduction outside of and alongside least cost. So right now least cost is a basket of mm -hmm of critical priorities which are then you know balanced as best they can by taking greenhouse gas reduction sort of out of the basket and having it co-equal with everything else combined again obviously employers can debate about what the language really impacts but that but that raises a potential concern of are, are we are we upsetting the balance of, of all the priorities that we need to focus um, and is that really appropriate or necessary mm -hmm. and again I'd be happy to you know, come back to you with, with more thoughts on, on that. Um, but just to loop back, and, and I kind of skipped over this part, as sort of a following on to having having the implementation authority and timing um, put into the hands of the legislature, um, we would further recommend that, um, that you remove the cause of action for court <coughs> enforcement of it. Um, and then frankly, I don't think you need to make the goals mandatory. Um, if the legislature is going to be involved in implementing uh, the, the targets along the way, um, if for whatever reason the legislature takes actions that that don't meet meet up with those mandatory goals, I would presume it would be for for, for some good reason or not. Um, I think as long as you, if you have certainly if you have an explicit cause of action, and even if you simply make it mandatory without an explicit cause of action, I think you just raise some some legal some potential legal concerns. Um, that I don't think are necessary if, if, um, if you go along with the, the legislative approval as you go through the, the schedule, the same schedule that the council is already supposed to be working on. There you are. Other than that, so do you want me to go back and draft that up for you? <laughs> 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 I think actually, I would be any, actually any, be pretty easy. Anything I could do to help. <laughs> I just remember um, just a, a um, comment um, following up on what what uh, uh, what you said and, and what the, the comment the chair just said because I think about this a lot in terms of the, the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware that um, depending on what it is they're man manufacturing and what the manufacturing process is, uh, that some industries are uh, at, at this point in time and for the immediate. Uh, foreseeable future, much more dependent on fossil fuels than others. Mm. Uh, those that require huge amounts of heat as part of the manufacturing <coughs> process 
that's that's where it comes from now. And I, I you know, I read of other alternatives, you know, coming along the pike, but not not next year. Uh, you know, ten years, maybe fifteen years from now. So I think that's something we should be um, uh, cognizant of. I think, uh, in, in, in it's just an observation because it it came up. I'm not making a particular. Uh, suggestion or proposal in terms of representation on the council or anything like that at this point. And I think a big part of that, that part of it too, in terms of what can be done and how quickly it can be done, you know, the challenge is, like you say, certain 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 production activities lend themselves better or, or worse to electrification um, versus fossil fuel. And frankly, in terms of, of, of if you're looking at a reduction path, the ability to convert from from basically diesel to natural gas, for example. I know you, you folks may not be aware of this, but you know, access to natural gas and natural gas infrastructure is kind of a complicated issue. So, so um, really? <laughs> Heidi has experience on committees where I've actually been able to make everybody laugh quite a bit. I'll, if I come back more often, hopefully I'll get you guys there. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated question. So. And, and I'll just um, add as a footnote to, to Avram's uh, point that um, something that we've had testimony on in this committee uh, and that other states have focused on, it's not something that's in this bill, is that the focus on emissions reduction should uh, relate to what the contribution of that pollution is. Um, you know, th there are certain sectors, transportation, um, which you've highlighted, uh, but then also certainly thermal um, are the major contrib you know, contributors in Vermont. And as you mentioned, uh, our manufacturers certainly um, uh, engage in transportation mm -hmm. and uh, heat plant floors. Um, but the industrial sector as a, um, as a contributor, as a piece of the pie, is actually pretty modest mm -hmm. in Vermont. Um, that's not to say that uh, manufacturing businesses aren't meaningful contributors, they are, but in kind of looking at the pieces of, of the pie that we want to focus on, we know where those are. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and part of this is sort of the interconnection between manufacturing and some of the other sectors, like yep. the transportation. Yeah. Side. Yep. I guess one, one thing I would just point out there, again, not, not, that, not that you folks don't see it this way too, um, you can certainly look at it from the perspective of where are the contributions coming from, mm -hmm. but then the, the relative distribution of contributions is not necessarily the same as the um, the availability of, of, of redress or measures. In other words, an area might be a big contributor, but you might face some significant limitations in how you actually can go after that that one. Um, you know, diesel transport, diesel fuel transportation is a very good example. That's really a, a chunk of the, of, the, of, the, of the contribution. But if you look at the efficiency of logistical planning and the technologies available, there are big challenges in trying to reduce that contribution. So, again, yeah, it's just an example of some of the things to look at. And airplanes might be an even better example. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to sort of grab a little bit, but another point, another question I think for folks, and this gets to uh, the rulemaking for ANR and the authority of it. Um, it wasn't clear to me looking at the bill. Obviously, the council will come up with all sorts of recommendations, um, but it looks like it's really A and R that's going to be um, doing the rules. And so it raises the question of: Does does any recommendation of the council, even if it's in an area that's not currently within the, within the jurisdiction or the or the traditional responsibility of A and R, say like some transportation sectors or other whatnot, that is is a and r actually going to be given both the authority and the responsibility of doing such rules as the bill is structured or as you might uh, change it so that's just yeah. the well. quick answer is they would have the authority not necessarily the responsibility the um, bringing people together in the council um, certainly allows regulation to occur in different places <coughs> there's nothing in the bill that precludes um, agencies that currently have authority uh, to use that authority um, how the bill is currently drafted is, at the end of the day, a &R, as the primary regulator of pollution, uh, air pollutant, mm -hmm. um, has the ultimate accountability um, for that. 
but uh, the, I, I think what the bill envisions is that uh, different agencies in state government would collectively work mm -hmm. to regulate. So, uh, Mike, I want to make sure you get your question. Yeah. So, um, thanks for coming here, Bill. I, I was listening, uh, but my computer wasn't catching up with uh, your, uh, the recommendations you had on the membership of the council. Mm -hmm. So if you could go over that once again. Uh, sure. I'll capture it this time. <laughs> yeah, very shortly. I, I think that farming and forestry should each have their own representative, um, have that combined. Um, I think there should be a representative from sort of the manufacturing slash industrial uh, sector, and then also one from transportation slash freight. Okay, manufacturing and industrial sector. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one? Transportation. Transportation. And yeah, in our mind, we're primarily thinking of Goods and supplies, sort of commercial freight transportation, but you know, I think there are organizations out there that represent those folks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the specific suggestions. Yep. Oh, oh.